Guillermo Arriaga is perhaps best known to date for his remarkable collaboration on three films with fellow Mexican director Inaritu, Amores Peros, 21 Grams, and Babel. Preferring to describe himself as a hunter who works as a writer, Arriaga claims to write from personal circumstances, injecting his stories with events that he has experienced or been involved with. His films are characterized by multi-stranded narratives interweaving several characters who are connected directly and indirectly by a single dramatic event. Through his multi-layered approach, he explores themes of grief, guilt, love, chance and alienation. With the exacting quality of his writing, it is no surprise that Arriaga has played an instrumental role in putting Mexican cinema on the world stage. Every time someone asks me a question, instead of answering with the, a concept, I answer with a story. If I don't tell stories, I think they will grab me from the throat and, and squeeze me and kill me. So I, I, I feel that I have to tell them in order not to be killed by them. You know, I think that screenplaying comes from several places. Sometimes screenwriting um, comes from an idea of someone else. So you develop the idea that someone else has. Sometimes you write uh, historical interpretations on something. And sometimes the screenwriting comes from personal places, or regionals. And um, I think that you have to measure the screenwriting from, from where it comes from. The stories I've been telling have been very personal stories. For example, Amores Perros, I, I don't know if you have seen Amores Perros, but Amores Perros involves dog fighting. Well, guess what? I have a dog whose name was Kofi. I was eight years old. He used to run away all the time, and there were dog fights where I grew up. And then they have this champion dog and say, hey, why don't you make this dog kill Guillermo's dog, just for fun. But my dog killed the other dog. So I use that story to tell the story of Amores Perros. Uh, the agreement with Alejandro Gonzalez in Amores Perros is that first, if it's going to be the credit, a film by it was going to be shared. And uh, that meant that I was through all the process. I was with him in the casting, I was with him in, in many steps. I'm not saying with this that I, I was directing, not at all. We were thinking that we were, we were going to work as, as a team like the Coen brothers. He and Inuritu started out at the same, you know, started collaborating together and they made, you know, several films, um, Amores Peros and then 21 Grams, which really kind of took the world by the scruff of the neck and kind of announced a new movement in Mexican filmmaking and in international cinema. When, when I wrote Amores Perros, it comes from two places. First, I have a car accident. Uh, it, I was sleeping on the back seat with no, no seat belt many years ago, and we, we fell on a cliff. So I woke up in the middle of the accident. And I become so obsessed with the accident that I wanted to write a trilogy of films based on accidents. 
And I was obsessed with what happened before the accident, what happened during the accident, and what happened after the accident. So that's the structure of Amores Perros. I remember the day I was going to release Amores Perros, the, the day before. I have a, a chat with a friend of mine, a, a screenwriter, who made a lot of concessions to his screenplay to make it commercial. A lot of concessions. And I say, man, what did you make such so many concessions to, 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 your, to your screenplay. It was beautiful. Now it, I cannot even recognize it. They say, because my friend, I'm going to be in Hollywood. Your shitty, arty movie about dogs is going to be seen by two people. Mine is going to bring me to Hollywood. It's not my friend. That's not the way it works. Why do we think that we have good rules on storytelling? Just because a Greek philosopher said 2,000 years ago it has to <coughs> Who says that in page 30, page 60, page 90, we have to follow always the same structure? I think that every story has a, a different way to be told. It's one of them. And we have to realize that in, in real life, in, in our daily life, we use extremely sophisticated storytelling. We never go linear. We never structure with the first act, the second act, and three acts. We always use this back and forth kind of storytelling. So why we have to go always with this kind of structure? I have read all these manuals of screenwriting. They say things that I will never follow. And I have learned that the first rule of screenwriting or any art is having no rules. Everyone has to find its own way of, of doing things. For example, uh, every screenwriting teacher says research. Research, research, research is the clue to everything. And I say, I'm so lazy to research. And first, I'm talking about myself and the things that happened to me, so why I have the need to research at all? So I do not do any kind of research, ever. <laughs> I wrote a film that takes place in Morocco, and uh, Babel, and, and, and a story in Japan. I had never been to Morocco, and I had never been to Japan. I make no research about how people live in Japan. I make no research of people how live in Morocco. <laughs> I've never been with... with uh, I had been with uh, goat, uh, how you say, goat keepers in the mountains of the desert of Mexico, and I'm sure they behave the same as the Moroccan <laughs> goat herd. You know? And I have a teenage girl in Mexico City, I'm sure that a teenage girl in Japan will behave exactly the same. So why I need to research? I don't do any kind of research, ever. I don't write any kind of uh, character development. You know, this backstory thing that means I had never. I don't write any outline or treatment ever. I don't have a preconceived structure ever. I just sit down and write. One of my favorite films that he was responsible for is 21 Grams. 21 Grams is a film about kind of unimaginable horrors, things that we just, we never want to face. You know, the death of a child or the death of a loved one or, a, or a, a, an illness that's gonna kill us. Um, now that, they could be uh, subjects that really kind of turn you off a film, that make, it, make, it you, make you unable to watch it, but that's not what's happened. He has an incredibly kind of skillful way of dealing with really raw emotions head on. You mind if I join? Actually, I was just leaving. Here you go. Maybe just until you finish? No, maybe next time. Did you know that eating alone can cause kidney damage? And that's bad. I have a mild infection in my heart. Nothing serious, but I was trying to be part of the, 
I wanted to have a tryout in the boxing um, for the Olympics, in the boxing team for the Olympics in the Mexican team. And I was training, so that mild infection in the heart become a mess. Uh, it went from the pericardium, which is the membrane that uh, it's around the heart, to the muscle. And the doctor told me, the infection goes inside, you need a heart transplant. It, never, it, it was never close that I will have a transplant, but just thinking about it make me write about 21 grams. All those thoughts that what will happen if I die. And um, once I was with a friend, we were 12 years old, and uh, he was 16. We have a, a, a high-powered rifle, a 306 caliber rifle, and it said in, in, in the bullets box, it said it can have a reach of five miles. And the guy was like, no way, five miles, nah. It should be 500 yards. No, it says five miles. Why don't we shoot the, the cars far away? We were in the desert, so we were watching cars and say, let's shoot them and see if it really hits so far away. They were like a kilometer away. And he was like, and I said, no, don't shoot them. Maybe. And what about if it's true? Nah, it's not true. And this is the origin of Babel. <laughs> I was once in, in one of these, uh, I was writing a screenplay and the producer, because I come from, from the novels, insisted that I had to go to um, one of these gurus of, uh, of uh, screenwriting seminars. And this was a woman. And she was saying, you must know everything about your character. Everything. You have to write a, the whole backstory of your character. You must know even how much change it has in its pocket. What kind of underwear it's wearing. And I say, fuck, this is so boring. <laughs> If I know everything about my characters, how am I going to be surprised by them? So I have no idea at all of where my characters are coming from, who their parents are. I have no idea. I'm not interested in it. I have no idea of what the end is, ever. I discover it. I always say, if you have an idea of how it's going to end, what's the fun of writing it? I know many writers say, if you don't have the end, don't write it. And I say, well, Again, how boring is that? If I know the end, what's the purpose of writing the story? I like to discover the end, so I have no idea of the end. The way I work in Hollywood is I pitch my stories to, to producers, and um, to several producers, and, they, and many of them is like, okay, and what happened next? And I have, I have no idea. <coughs> what's the end? I have no idea. And you want me to pay this amount of money for something you have no idea how it's going to end? Yeah, it's going to end good. Don't worry. <laughs> so I like, I love to discover the end. I hate when I know everything. So that's why I don't write an outline. Why write a, a, a treatment? <coughs> and I have no preconception. I have no preconceived ideas. I have just a very vague idea of where the story is heading and what structure it needs. So the way I write the stories is I sit down and begin writing. Now I've been teaching seminars, uh, and many people is asking me if there's any technique. And I think that the only technique for writing has to come not from the technique itself, but from questions about important things. There's something that causes a lot of anxiety in writers, is the notion that we have only one gallon of ink, and that sooner or later we run out 
of that gallon. And if uh, you pay the bills writing, like it's my case, you send the, the, the kids to school with your writing, you are terrified that you will have nothing else to say forever. We never know when this finishes. We hope it never ends. The way I begin writing is, is very simple. I have a, like a, a story that happened to me when I was young or that happened to me. These kind of stories stay in my head for years and years and years. So then I, I have an idea of how they begin. I don't have a, a, a preconceived structure. I have some idea of how it's going to be the structure, and I have some idea of how the story is going to be, where it's moving to, toward. But I have no, no really uh, an organized, logical steps to go there. I just began writing. And if you look at something like Babel, which has you know, four different stories, each of which has three different time frames. So you're really kind of messing with an audience's head, trying to kind of unpick who's where and what, you know. And, and I think what it, what it forces you to do by telling a story in that kind of rather unconventional way um, is, is, is forces you as an audience member to really get what's important in the story, to really kind of understand a kind of, you know, what a character is trying to do or what they're going through. Sometimes what drives me to, to, to have a, a structure is a concept, a basic concept. For example, in um, The Brain Plane, the concept was the four elements. I wanted to have a story of water, I want to have a story of earth, I want to have a story of, of, of wind, and a story of fire. And I have these elements that I wanted to go through all these stories, but that's the only thing that really gave me some kind of structure. Even though I knew it was an Ariaga film and I knew it was going to be a kind of jumble of narrative to a certain extent, I spent the first half an hour of the film really trying to kind of impose my own sort of narrative norm on it without, before I suddenly remembered or realised that actually those things aren't important and that you just need to kind of focus on the moment um, and that's how you'll get the best out of the film. And, you know, it, it, when I subsequently saw the film, I realised that watching the first ten minutes wouldn't have helped me at all in trying to kind of piece things together in the way that I was, like I was watching a normal film. Why did your mom wear to bed? A slip. Can you put it on? I'm wearing my father's shirt. not to touch me. I promise. Every time I write a scene or a story and it's not working, I think, how will Shakespeare solve this? It happens to me in Amores Perros. Amores Perros, there was a story it wasn't working. And I say, how can it work? And I say, Shakespeare. And Shakespeare, uh, way of doing things is the closest the characters are, the greatest the conflict. Think of uh, Hamlet. Who killed Hamlet's father? Who is marrying Hamlet's mother? Macbeth. Macbeth, he, he wants the throne. In order to kill the throne, he has to kill the king. But the king is his best friend. And the one who's pushing him to kill his best friend is his wife. So when you put things so close, conflict becomes much larger, bigger. So that's something I use. That's a trick that I give to you. Think like Shakespeare.
Guillermo's screenplays are fantastic to read. They're incredibly kind of poetic, not flowery, but poetic. They have, they have, the language is very, very simple. Uh, he sums up a lot of kind of individual moments that would perhaps normally be in the hands of a director. They would be the things that you would think of as being this is what the director has brought to a film as opposed to a, to a screenwriter. But they're not. The, you know, the individual poetic um, uh, visual uh, moments in the, of a film are often down to Guillermo's script. Sometimes in, in, in the rehearsal and sometimes because, as you can see, English is not my mother tongue. My, uh, they tell me, you know something, in English it will sound better like this, but... So they, they make me some comments about how the dialogue sounds. In Spanish, no, in Spanish I'm absolutely sure how it's gonna sound. No, no doubt about it. In English, of course, I have some doubts, not very often. I, sometimes I invent expressions. I have like a rule to write one line dialogue, so it's not difficult to build in English. And I don't want to portray I'm like the slang kind of guy that knows the streetwise kind of talking, you know? It's very straightforward, narrative moving dialogue. And sometimes I, I'm just hear some expression and I try to put it like have a, a hint of slang, but I'm not obsessed with trying to look uh, like a particular thing. That's makes it that makes it difficult, but but I have a, a, a translator who works very close to me and he tells me, yeah, it will sound or not it will sound. Sometimes I very strong and say, let it that way. See, no one speaks like that in English. I don't give a damn, leave it that way. I've been very actively involved in most of the films I have, I have written. I have even producer credit in, in some of them. I'm even an actor in one of them. And I'm very close to the films, except for Babel, where I was, I have trouble with the director. I've been very closely involved with the other ones. Even in, even in the editing room, because the way I write the screenplays, taking a scene out creates a snowball effect. So I have to be there and be sure that the structure will not be uh, falling down. I, I, it has to be very meticulously cut. Well, I think when you hand over your work, it's because you are trusting the director, especially something so personal. And it has to do basically with a matter of taste. You have to have a good taste, and they have a, a, a similar approach of what you think of the film, I think it's the right director. For example, the first time I met Tommy Lee Jones, I, uh, we began talking about literature, and I asked him, which is your favorite living American author, writer? And he said, uh, Cormac McCarthy, and I said, wow, it's the same as me. Which is your favorite filmmaker? And among many names, he picked up Kurosawa. And he says, turn, turn back to you. And there were the, the, um, the um, sketches that Kurosawa uh, have uh, drawn for, I think it was Ren. So I said, well, he likes Kurosawa. And then he liked uh, trailers and trailer parks and these uh, kind of places. And he liked the desert and he liked hunting. So I say, I, I, I can easily make a film with this guy because we have so much, many things in common. And if we have a skeleton here right now, we will kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable, but nothing serious. But what about if I have a, a guy who has just three days dead, a rotting corpse? Will we feel uncomfortable? What happens with the rotten flesh that creates such an anxiety on us? What happens with the smell? Why, why don't we, uh, we are not shocked to have a skeleton here and we're so shocked if we see a cadaver here? So I decided that I would like to, to have a corpse being a protagonist of a film. Smells like something dead around here. I killed a deer a couple days ago, starting to turn. Yeah. Well, you better throw it away. It's rotten. I want to keep the hide. You got any salt I could use to cure it? No, son. I barely got enough salt to put on the dinner table. 
You got any alcohol or anything like that? I got a jug of antifreeze. Would that work? Suck on this hose. Man's won't eat him anymore after this. You're crazy. I think what Guillermo is concerned to do is to find the connections between apparently random acts. I mean, he famously doesn't start with a kind of beginning, middle and end, nor does he end with beginning, middle and end um, in any story. He starts with a series of images or of small random incidents, things largely that have happened to him. Um, and he finds something interesting about them, you know, a particular illness that he has or, you know, seeing a building burning when he was a young boy. Um, you know, those things He's obviously, he's obviously kind of stored up and, and finds a story to go with them. But, you know, what, what's interesting about them ultimately is how he then finds connections between those individual stories and the individual characters that he's dreamt up um, and how they all interrelate. You cannot write linear and then cut and paste. Because the way the uh, non-linear kind of structure that I use, the way it works, this is another trick, is because of the dramatic questions. You need dramatic questions. And that dramatic questions, you must feel them. You have to feel them. I don't have this, like, the, this kind of writer who have the wall full of papers with where it's going, everything. I have it in my head. I know where I'm going, more or less. In 21 grams, I knew that the audience, because it was so chaotic, needed a, um, a handlebar where they had to grab. For me, the handlebar was going to be the light. 21 grams is written in light. What do I mean? For example, the, the first part of 21 grams, it, it happens during the day. This means the character have some light in, in, their, in, in their lives. They are living more, more or less well. And the audience understand that this is a part because it's light. It's, this is subconscious. I, I'm sure that you have not noticed it if you have seen 21 grams. The second part is all during the night. And the third part is <coughs> at dawn or dusk. And that's on purpose. And that comes from the screenplay. It hurts a lot when they say in 21 grams, such great editing. No, my friend, the structure comes from the, from, the, from the screenplay. I mean, there is a sort of fairly conventional narrative arc going on, um, but it is kind of chopped and changed. Now, I always had imagined that that would happen at the edit, um, that that would be much more of a collaboration between editor and screenwriter, um, you know, coming back to kind of make the story more interesting. But apparently that's not how it happens. And, you know, the screenplays that we look at, uh, you know, the published screenplays that we look at, which are extraordinarily close to the, to the edit, the, the edited film that we all know, they're, they're so close. And, you know, that's, that's the way he imagined it. And many people think that I really write linear and then cut and paste. No. I just sit and write because you have to feel things. The process of discovering uh, um, art is the same as discovering the person you love. It needs surprises. And the more profound is the storytelling, the more profound is the, 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 the person you love. I think what Guillermo allows us to do is to face some of the most awful things that we couldn't imagine, the, 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 the kind of absolute life and death issues. But he does it with a kind of lightness of touch that, that I don't know where he gets it from, that, that allows us to kind of, you know, spend time with these characters going through such awful things um, without wanting to kind of run for the door. If there's too much planning and there's too much preparing 
what you're going to write about, he will not be surprised by it. That's what I, I, I don't like to write in the tree structure kind of things on page 30. I don't like to have no backstory about the characters. I don't like to have an outline. And I want to be as free as possible to have these things coming naturally. You cannot decide if it's going to be a success or not. There's no way of deciding that. There's no progress in art. Your last work is not going to be better than your first one. So the best, the best thing is to be authentic and, and honest with your own work. <laughs>